Hey, uh, if you're not a Hall of Famer today, it's going to be hard to get on this show. I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> if you're not a Hall of Famer, that leaves me and Bodwell on the outs here. Because Matt's in the Hall of Fame yeah, at yeah, Marksburg High School. But, but mine is like a minor league <laughs> Hall of it's Fame. It's a Hall of Fame. It's, it's, it's a Hall of Fame. You know, it's, it's still an HOF. It's like single A ball, ball here. Is it? <laughs> You're still signed to a contract, right? You're playing ball for a living. Uh, <laughs> with a tattoo, it, tattoo, tattoo on your arm. Yeah, yeah. HOF. <laughs> HOF. Got Without the, a doubt. Got the orange jacket, right? The tattoo. So, Coach, you got a tattoo? Uh, no. Not no, yet. Uh, it's no. coming. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Head coach Monty Cater, retired from the Shepherd Rams, and recently uh, learned that he would be inducted into the uh, NCAA College Football Hall of Fame, which uh, this is the big one here. As mm-hmm. far as college football goes, you're in there with the greatest who have ever played or coached the game. Monty uh, Cater, good morning, and thanks for coming in. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate it. it uh, it's it is humbling, and, and if people get tired of hearing me say that, it, they don't know what that really feels like. Mm-hmm. It is, and you, just to be a, a part of that is is really special. And you know, you talk about all the people you've been involved with, and you got to do what you wanted to for forty seven years. You didn't get mm-hmm. fired, so you know that's that. It was it was special, but at the same time, a surprise. Well, congratulations to you. I know you, you you've probably been told that a thousand times from uh, former players. Uh, guys that you coached with, administrators, and just people that you know around uh, the community. But this is an amazing honor and well, so well deserved. Uh, you brought uh, and continued to bring excellence to Shepherd University football. There were some great coaches who came before you, and you, you took what they did and brought it to an entirely new level where suddenly nationally Shepherd was now known on the Division II college football scene. And for that, uh, an entire community uh, is grateful to you mm-hmm. for that. And I know you're going to tell me you had great assistants and great players, but it starts at the top. Well, I had great assistants and great players. So. <laughs> <laughs> but but that it is all a part of it. And that's, you know, people say, well, do you miss it? And yeah, you do, but you miss it because of the people. Mm-hmm. And uh you know, all try to get all those people. We're all trying to go ahead and get one goal taken care of, and you really work at it year round. So, I don't miss the twenty-four hour a day, seven days a week, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, with recruiting so much. But mm-hmm. uh, but that's a big part of it, and uh, you know, it and it, that part of it's different even since I've retired. You know, I I think I covered my first Shepherd game somewhere in the early to mid nineties. Jay Mason was still the starting quarterback at that point. A young Phil McCoy was on the offensive line. Now Phil, of course, a stalwart in our community uh, with uh, Ameriprise Financial, and he's a youth volleyball coach too. Uh, And then I was also assigned on a weekly basis to do 10-minute interviews with every football coach in the area uh, each week, right? So all the high schools and and Monty Cater. And I have to say, Monty, the conversations that I would have with you uh, could have been had with uh, a physics professor or or the librarian or uh, a, a, a drama teacher because w- when we spoke you you didn't get into x's and o's strategy you were the most conversational football coach i think i've ever spoken with in my life and and now as an assistant high school football coach and I've, and I've met so many you know, coaches just in the path of what I do. Still, nobody compares to you in terms of just having a conversation about your team. It doesn't get technical, and anybody could have had the conversation with you. But I wish you hadn't mentioned the physics part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I got some bumps on my arm and everything here standing up. But, well, I, and I appreciate that, but I don't think that's always what people want is X's and O's anyway. So, you know, if that was something that came across well, that that's great. But, you know, I think you want to go ahead and get some information out there that deals more with uh, – people or the side of somebody that you might not know and uh, you know the x's and o's that's crazy and it could be different with every person that you talk to how it fits into their system and why it's the greatest thing in history of time so uh, but no that's 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 nice to hear Matty I always appreciated the ability to say what you wanted to say 
especially after maybe a, a bad call or a, a poorly officiated game and, and getting it out in such a, a cool way. I, I can recall moments of like, you know, well, I, I really can't say anything about that horrible call in quarter number three because I get fined for things like that. But, you know, so it was kind of that backhanded way of getting it out. Uh, how, how early on in your coaching career did you kind of develop and learn that skill? You know, I really had some good teachers and, uh, you know, a couple of them have actually gotten back with me. Uh, the guy that gave me my first job as in high school was uh, was a senior when I was a freshman in college, and we kind of stayed close. But uh, you know, he's out in Denver now, and uh, and obviously he's retired since he was older than I was too. But uh, you know, he was pretty good at that, fiery, but kept it under control in certain situations where you know it's only going to get worse if you tell him what you would like to tell. Him. <laughs> so you find the creative way to get your point across. You do. And, and go from there. Take us back to that beginning of your coaching career. Uh, as a football player, you know, as a, a kid coming up and through high school and then on to college and so forth, at what point did it kind of hit you, this coaching thing might be what I'd like to do? Matt, I tell you, when I knew I love football, and I got a chance to play junior high football, which was kind of unique because it wasn't with a school. It was almost like a, a, a rec league when I was in seventh and eighth grade. And, and then – our family moved to, to Shelbyville out of Decatur. Decatur's a big town, you know, it was almost 100,000 at the time. And so we got a chance to go ahead and get into a little bit more of a rural setting. But Merle Chapman was a, he was just an outstanding coach. And, uh, and we had some success. And he ended up giving me my first college job, as a matter of fact. But I think really early on, as much as I loved it, I never really wanted to get away from it. So even in my younger years, even in high school, I thought, you know, since I had 145 pounds, probably the NFL is not going to come calling. <laughs> I don't understand that. But, but the bottom line was I, I wanted to stay in it. And, and coaching was something, you know, maybe because I'd been around good coaches mm -hmm. at that point in time uh, that, that I wanted to go ahead and continue to do the same thing. I remember reading your scouting report on you, Marty. It said he's not big, but at least he's slow. And it, it, it registered with me because it was like mine. <laughs> I, I told my wife, even yesterday, I said, yeah, I had a chance to play professional football, and she's scoffing like you can't believe. And, uh, I think it was going to be one of those – I'd gotten out of college, and there was a guy with uh, that had played with Minnesota a little bit, but he would played in our league when I was at Millican, and uh, it was going to be the Lake County Rifles. And believe it or not, that ended up being a, the USFL team oh, or no whatever. Kidding. Yeah, the Chicago f Fire, Wind, whatever it was, Storm. <laughs> I had no business playing any kind of professional football <laughs> at the size that I was. So coaching was the best way for me to stay in the sport. I just wondered if as a kid, you know, the scenario that, that most kids have, right? You're out in the yard and you're by yourself and you got the football and you're, you know, so-and-so, whatever your favorite receiver is, runs down the field and you throw the ball up to yourself and you catch it and you're like, you scored. I just wondered, has there ever been that young kid that's that's going, okay, this is a fourth down situation and a yard to go. Um, I want my full back here. And you know, do, do, you, do you have that young kid who's going in his mind, the coaching of the game, that, that here's the play I want to run in that scenario and and then dreaming there's the handoff and he's up the middle and they, there it is coach made the right call he's got the first down i just i don't are there kids out there that maybe that that's where it starts that right that, probably yeah is that where it starts so so take us from the transition uh, lakeland college to an opportunity to be at shepherd university had you heard of shepherd university and, and how did that come about you know it was uh, a chance to go ahead and go up to lakeland very tiny school uh, it had been a, a seminary at one point in time, so it's kind of outside Sheboygan. But, uh, you know, it, it was a great opportunity as well, and, and we struggled early on. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't pretty. And uh, I had a lot of people that had graduated. I got the job in April, and almost no recruiting had been done because no one know, knew what, you know, who's going to be the head coach. Mm -hmm. Maybe he don't want this quarterback or whatever. I don't but and we ended up getting some great kids and by the time we finished it, it was really really uh, a lot of fun I've had a lot of those guys have called and uh, coaches even a guy I'd umpired with for a number of years uh, had called and uh, and congratulated me but Lakeland was so much different and we were winning we'd won two championships in a row and I had shared a third and a chance to go ahead. Larry Kaufman was one of my uh, assistant coaches, and he ended up getting the, the baseball. He was the baseball coach at, at Lakeland, too. He ended up getting a job at D&E, 
and he talked to Dean Pease, who at that time was at Shepherd and was, you know, heading actually at that point in time, kind of the physical education department and the athletic would oversee that. And it was kind of different, but he was the baseball coach. So they talked, and they were looking at that transition time between when Coach Barr decided to go ahead and, and leave, and uh, and you know Mike Jacobs was going to be the interim coach, but was not going to go ahead and continue that because mm-hmm. at that point didn't want you to be the athletic director and the head football coach. And, and years later, I can certainly understand why <laughs> they didn't want to do that, but. They talked. I finally got an interview, and it was kind of crazy. I was in December and uh, really liked it, a chance to move up to a scholarship level, whatever level, because Lakeland certainly wasn't, and uh, that was back when you had NEIA, both one and two. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, they talked. I got the interview, but nothing happened for a long time. I finally got a newspaper reporter from Sheboygan Press uh, up up in Sheboygan, and, uh, hey, hey, I heard you got a new job. I'm going, well, you heard something I didn't. <laughs> so uh, I got the call later on that evening and, uh, you know, a chance to go ahead and, and come out. They said a lot of people turned the job down. It was not big time money because Coach Saban and I, we probably wouldn't be hanging out at the same country clubs. And everything, but well, but you, it was it you, was a chance to get out. Do you remember your starting salary at uh, Shepherd? I presume you had to teach class too. Yes, we did. Uh, but a lot of it, that, that was more towards the end of the time there because a lot of a lot of colleges do this. And I, I was in the same position at Millican when I was an assistant coach. They tie you into the admissions office a little bit. And it, like they didn't care how great the players were you recruited, but you better get 35. So... <laughs> But, but you mentioned the salary. So I get here, and the first thing they do is you read in the newspaper that, that they list uh, all the salaries of all the head coaches in uh, the West Virginia Conference. <laughs> My name was at the bottom. No. So, yeah, it wasn't, mm-hmm. uh, it wasn't pretty, but nobody was making a lot of money at that point in time, unless you were at Fairmont. Then, uh, then you get the big money up there. <laughs> they paid well. <laughs> oh. Johnny B. Coach, what was your favorite part? Did you, I mean, obviously, recruiting is a huge part. Did you like the, the recruiting side or the actual, you know, the Saturdays on the sideline, the, the calling the plays, the, the, the watching all the hard work come to fruition? Which, which did you prefer? You know, that's, that's a tough question because the, the prep is, is everything. And Saturday, you finally get a chance to see, you know, did you prepare for the right things? Not just the right offense and defense, but you get personnel in the proper positions and everything else. But I think the prep is almost better than game day. Uh, because you're not you say how many different decisions you're going to make. We're going to go for it on fourth down, or we're going to go ahead and punt, and you know hope that's the right decision too. But I think the preparation was probably a little bit more fun. Just doing the right things. You watch film forever, and my wife would say, "Hey, nice to see you once in a while." And you know you're spending 16 hours a day, and uh, my kids going, "Hey, is that dad?" So it, <laughs> it was uh, it was tough, but I, I think. All that prep is is probably what gives you the most satisfaction, especially if you find out that you did it the right way or that we did it the right way. Well, speaking of, of you know calling the plays and should we punt, should we this? As a, a Hall of Fame coach and someone who's who coached for forever, when you watch football, do you find yourself watching the game and saying, okay, now here they should run this, here they should run that. Why did they run that? It didn't work. I would have done that. Do you find yourself sort of you know Monday morning quarterbacking coaching in your head? Without a doubt. Nice. I, I, anybody that says they don't is full of beans. So uh, I, I don't think you do the, the, the real minute things, but things that, uh, you know, we, get, we need to get another guy to kick extra points. You know, that was easy last <laughs> night. But <laughs> what we needed, Matt, I was going to call you and see if they called you. But, the, uh, but I, I think the biggest thing is that, uh, you know, I, I think just – Having a chance to go ahead and say, maybe I wouldn't have done that, or what are you thinking, or yelling, then that's not good if everybody's trying to sleep. But, uh, yeah, you do. <laughs> You're not going to ever get that out of your system. You can't. Nice. If that's all you've done for this long, it's never going to leave, and I don't really want it to. That's tremendous. Marty Cater is our guest. It's Hall of Fame Day on the show today, and uh, in the first hour, Marty Cater has been inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame. Now, mind you, uh, this is not the Division II College Football Hall mm-hmm. of Fame. This is the college football hall of fame the the kind that every college football player who's great you've ever heard of is in and uh, in nine o'clock hour john lowry who's been inducted into uh, another baseball hall of fame we'll kind of get into the details of that in the nine o'clock hour 
will join us uh, at that time, too. Uh, so, Marty, uh, before we go a whole lot further here, you mentioned kicking, and I pointed at Matt Miller because I'm going to guess many of our listeners don't know this, but early on in your coaching career, this guy shows up as a student athlete ready to try out for kicker at Shepherd. Actually, it's the other way around. He showed up while I was in the locker room. Um, it was it was it was that that January. I went to Shepherd not in in the fall like most normal students. <clears throat> I I was out of school for a while and had been in a job. And so when I went to Shepherd, I went in the spring semester and I thought I'm 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 going to walk on and try to be a place kicker. And so it was actually Coach Jacobs. I walked into his office and we we had this conversation as he and I called games. Um, do you remember when I walked in and he's like vaguely because. Because you know, as and and Coach Cater, you can verify. You know, you're so busy, and he's doing something on paper. As I knock on his door, and he looks up quickly and doesn't recognize who's this goofy guy there at the door, and he's like, "Yeah." And I'm like, uh, Coach, uh, uh, you got a minute? Sure. And he goes right back to what he's doing while I'm standing there, you know, a feet from his desk. I'm like, yeah, uh, my name's Matt Miller, and uh, um, uh, I wanted to try out for the football team. And he just looks up at me and, uh, what position? Uh, kicker. I already got two kickers. And he goes right back to working again. And I'm like, D -d do you have room for a third? I I I'll walk on and try out. And he just looked back up again and went, we meet tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Be downstairs. Because we were in the old Sarah Cree building. And I'm like, okay, thanks, coach. And he never looked back up again. And I walked out the door and went, boy, that was weird. You know? And, and I show up at practice the next day. And, and uh, I can't remember how long into spring um, the, the introduction comes. Here is your new head football coach. And and here comes Monty Cater into the room. And so, uh, so yeah, I was there. And, and he yelled at me a few times. Um, I, I remember one practice in particular, special teams at the beginning of practice. And uh, we're, we're up where the new dormitory is now i yeah. mean you know that was a practice field and we were working on kickoffs rich pool was the kicker back at that time and uh you know a record setter in his day those records since broken and, and he he totally missed hit a couple of kickoffs and i can't remember our, our, our number two guy uh straight on kicker like myself rich was soccer style played australian rules you know football that sort of thing mm -hmm. in, in his days and so anyway the next guy up he blows one it's like can I get a kicker that can actually give me a decent kickoff? And so I, Miller, get, I jump in there, and sure enough, I miss hit it too, shank it off the side, and then I get yelled at. And I think we kind of went went to something else in special teams at that point. It's like, you kickers are all worthless. So, so. <laughs> Rich, do you remember it that way? <laughs> Rich is always going to kick us a touchdown. You know, uh, Now, he was a great catcher too. He was yeah. a really good baseball player. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he was – kind of funny you he had that accent and everything mm -hmm. yeah big guy too you he know was. when you think of a kicker you think sometimes of a little skinny guy that you know has that powerful leg but rich rich would run over you too so. would do that <laughs> Monty, what were some of the challenges in your early coaching days at shepherd university to try to get the program to where you eventually wound up with a bit other than the kickers <laughs> other than someone who can kick it straight rob we had uh you know, getting used to being able to offer a scholarship, that was kind of different, too. And when I got the job that first year was uh, was in February, and I spent the first almost month sitting behind a desk bringing in recruits because very much like Lakeland had been when I was there or first got there, no one was able to say, well, we better go offer this guy. And then somebody comes in that's going to be the head coach and says, why, why did we do that? We wasted that or that's not going to fit into the system. But it, I think the biggest thing was just trying to go ahead and, and get a staff together. Uh, the recruiting was going to be a part of any college football coach's uh, big deal you know, throughout the year. And I, I think we were able to go ahead and, and do a pretty good job of that. But you know, if you can have a staff that – you can count on that's and you can't always do that but it's going to be there year after year i mean you look at jeff castillo was 12 years mm -hmm. uh, bob haley was with me 13 uh, i talk about ernie mccook i was like 18 yeah. uh, and he certainly proved that he should be the head coach mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, josh klein never left i keep saying that he came in 2004 as, as a player and worked his bottom off as a small defensive lineman but you know when he got done then he started being like a student coach then got his masters and you know he had a couple good people that were his mentors with you know with coach castile and coach haley but uh it it's wild that uh that if you can keep those people together it, that's recruiting that same person's going into that school. I mean, I can't go into all of them, just like no one can cover them all. Uh, 
but at the same time you have that the continuity with the kids one year to the next and and we weren't making a pile of money and we can kid about that but that you know at this level it's not like you're getting that division one contract but you keep those guys together and i think that had the biggest uh, probably the biggest impact on us because of what it dealt with not only on the field but with recruiting and everything else, and obviously we're all teaching, but uh, I think that probably had the biggest impact on, on our program. Let's do our halftime break here. It's Hall of Fame Day here on the program, and in the 9 o'clock hour, John Lowry recently inducted into another Baseball Hall of Fame, and Marty Cater recently inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame, and a well-deserving honor for uh, the man who took Shepherd University to a Final Four matchup and then to a finals matchup, too. And who would have believed that uh, Little Shepherd College would one day wind up playing on national TV for a national championship? But uh, Monty Cater raised those expectations to the point where when Shepherd lost a game, you would go, what's wrong with that program over there? <laughs> I don't mean a playoff game, I mean a regular season game. Like, what's wrong? Mm-hmm. Why aren't they 10-0 and again? Uh, and, and, Monty, sometimes you can become a prisoner of your own expectations that you've set, right? You, you can. My wife learned a lot of things in the stands. On, on game. <laughs> a lot of things about you that you didn't even know. Everybody's that's, smarter than the head coach, right? That's true. A lot of advice. But, uh, oh, I don't know. But, again, it was uh, – what a great time. And it was. And it was uh, special. And I mentioned the people. But, you know, it wasn't just the coaches and, and, and players. You know, our administration was good. Got to see a lot of that. Uh, I kind of kidded it. Saw seven presidents and, like, five athletic directors and – one of them wasn't very good. That was me. But the uh, <laughs> and, and two of the presidents were interim before you know they hired someone else full time. But you got to see a lot of things. The transition from NAIA to NCAA, mm-hmm. uh, just just a lot of things. We went from you know grass to turf, and uh, got to see so many different things over that period of time. But thirty one years is a long time. You ought to see a few things that sure. are a little different. But it uh, you know uh, it's not something you'd ever forget. And uh, you know don't. Don't even think uh, at any point in time, you know, that it wasn't it wasn't a lot of fun. Even, and I know this comes up a lot. Why, you know, you, you had a chance maybe to look at some other schools because of you know you were, had a winning record, but I think you're looking or you're not. And there was only a couple places that I did look at: California, up in uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, left there with the job. <laughs> Two days later, they called me and told me that I didn't have the job because the president loved this one guy from down south or whatever. So anyway, there was that. And then Morgan State, and that was a very unique situation that both uh, we had both white finalists for that job. And uh, the president said no. So the athletic director quit, and, uh, and, and that one didn't work out. Looked at Southern Illinois only because I had gone to graduate school there and from Southern Illinois, but uh, that one didn't really work out either. But y- you're looking or you're not. And I didn't spend my time doing that. So it, it's comfortable. And they say, well, you, you know, maybe you just didn't want to do that. I, I really enjoyed where I was and, uh, and the people that I was around. And that's certainly, certainly something that was very satisfying for the time that I was there. I want to ask you about the Grand Valley State semifinal uh, game. The atmosphere for that game was like any, nothing else I've, I've uh, been a part of. Uh, at the small college football level because that sounded like a major college game. I don't know what the final attendance figures were for that, but it sounded like 50,000 people ringing through the Valley. That was just amazing. It, it was. I think it was over 7,000. Mm-hmm. We, we have always done very, very well in uh, in the NCAA playoffs at Shepard with the amount of people that are there, the mm-hmm. attendance figures. And, uh, you know, that's we've had great backing, and, and you know that was one of the, the greatest games I was ever a part of. There's no doubt about it. Then Jack Lynn who'd been a shepherd assistant for a couple of years uh very very good coach was assistant head coach at uh, grand valley at that point in time still there but uh what a a great day that was and uh, the the next saturday was as much fun but that, <laughs> but but that was that was really a, an enjoyable time well and and beating grand valley i just looked it up i mean shepherd has an enrollment of what four or five thousand grand valley has twenty five thousand students I mean that's that's bigger than most D1 programs. There's a lot of big schools up there in that mm-hmm. league, and uh, you know Ferris is decent size, but uh, it, yeah, I mean it, and their their facilities are un, unbelievable yeah. too. I mean you'd think it's a Division One school with with the types of things that they have up there for facilities. So it was great. Tell us the mindset 
that that you brought to that program and and that that you looked for in your assistant coaches because you talked earlier you, no one was getting rich uh, you weren't fully funded, so it's not like you could bring in all of the great talent and promise them all kind of money. You're kind of a little behind the eight ball in many ways, and yet everybody who's in sports has that competitive level in them, right? I'm going to prove to you that we can get this done. And you all did that. You went out without all of the bells and whistles that maybe other programs had and were very successful again and again and again and competed with those types of programs. How, how, what's that feeling like? Take us into you know, your, your mindset, the coaching uh, staff's mindset. Well, and again, I need to mention continuity, being able to go ahead and have staff that did stay with you for long mm-hmm. periods of time. And whether that was recruiting, whether those are the things that you wanted to do, you know, everybody makes some changes. Well, we're not going to run that defense anymore. Well, we're going to have, you know, a lot of the, the basic tenets of that defense we're going to still run. And uh, we got away from running the option, which is what I wanted to do when I came here. And Jay Mason loved that part of it. Uh, Jim Signora, also somebody else that uh, very much enjoyed that. But I, I think that uh, – continuing to go ahead and when you say try and b- build something i mean they were winning when i got here uh, they'd won uh, mike jacobs and, and the staff and players had won a a championship the year before but we did lose a lot of people and so we did kind of start from scratch we got a share of it the second year but the third year i got fired matt i mean you, you think about we were like what three and seven or something and it was one of the most i want to say challenging there's another word that i would use but challenging uh, was, <laughs> was going to have to do today but I, I think that the idea of being able to go ahead and understand yeah we're not going to be fully funded um keeping those guys with us year after year and they're good coaches i mean you think some of the people i mean you don't always talk about you know just jeff and 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 you know bob haley and and mark robichaud he was here with us for quite a while and everything too and 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 josh and ernie but we also had other people that were very very good too joel gordon was uh, he wasn't too bad and uh, joel just you know he's gone from my well I, nobody's happier uh, uh, about a, a new quarterback and with the 49ers than joel gordon who mm-hmm. had a chance to go ahead and and coach him in college but he's down in southern in south florida now but uh you know we, we had some great people and and everybody bought in and i think that was part of them staying around we didn't have wholesale transfers every year some of the younger guys they think well this guy's going to be here two more years by that time i'll be a senior i'd like to play someplace but it's not like this crazy transfer portal thing and uh you know, I, I think we worked hard at trying to find people who would fit into what we were trying to do. All coaches will tell you that, but I think that probably was a strength that we had that we were able to go ahead and find people that did fit. And, uh, you know, you had some diamonds in the rough, and then sometimes you got somebody you can't believe you got. <laughs> Uh, but it was, you know, it was a great time. But I, I think all those pieces fit together, and I was the person that was lucky enough to have those people. You mentioned almost getting fired because I go back to that 2015 run to a national championship game appearance and only a few years earlier there, there were back to back I think the one year was was uh, um, maybe five and five and then uh, right after that 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 Thursday night game down at Glenville State for a chance to be seven and three and and after some disappointing losses feel good going into the offseason and and that game did not go well and you finish six and four and you look at those back to back seasons after the successes prior and go on a division one level there may have been a call hey let's change this coaching staff and make uh, adjustments and on this division two level that doesn't happen and you guys are able to then make a run like that did you see that in that team you know even the, 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 and those struggles may be preparing them for for then successes that came well i think that's pretty well put i i think that you know while that disappointment was there we felt like we could be we could be better and we should be better and maybe it's a game or two seven and three maybe you could go nine and one or instead of six and four or eight and two whatever it might right. be but uh but i think that uh, no one stopped believing yeah, there's some tough places to play i mean without a doubt there's some places and you know glenville fairmont always where they <laughs> when, when i was hired they said, you better beat those guys or you won't be here long so <laughs> okay that's about as blunt as it can be but uh but i, I think that 
our guys and the people in the program believed that we could be a little bit better. Now, were we going to go ahead and, and make the playoffs every year? We'd had a chance to win some conference championships, mm-hmm. but you know, once we got into the the, uh, the Mountain East, and it was a little bit different, and and the whole split from the West Virginia Conference was. We're in a huge conference. When we go ahead and talk about things, half the schools don't play football, and so I, I think that was, uh, you know, that was something that we're going to have to play just a little bit better. We're going to have to meet these expectations. Mm-hmm. We're going to play some different people. We're going to travel a little bit more. I mean, UVA wise and Urbana, those were some long, long trips. Yeah. And uh, but I think at the same time, our, our guys are ready to do that, and no one, you know, backed away from from the challenge. And uh, that was part of the fun part. Tell me about Rich Rodriguez. In his early days of coaching, he was in the West Virginia Conference a couple of different times, if I recall, too, once this program got canceled. Uh, in fact, John Partington, who you remember, I'm sure, as the sports reporter from the Journal, was actually right. the guy that told Rich that his football program had gotten canceled. He didn't even know it uh, at the time there, too. But uh, tell me a little bit about that. Rich was a unique individual, very driven. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt of that, and uh, that that hasn't changed. He's gone through some unique experiences, but I don't think there's there's any doubt that uh, that he was a very very good football coach and, and a, a talent for developing quarterbacks. Because I know that was one of the things that really stood out, and that you better prepare for when you play. But uh, yeah, the thing at Salem, my gosh, we we played them twice. We played down there once, and then uh, the second year that we played, we went before they dropped the program, was was up at Shepherd, and uh, they didn't travel first class either. I mean, mm-hmm. it was one of those things where they're eating sandwiches off the the hood of the bus, and but they were always tough. And it's just like you know, then with Glenville State, uh, they were always going to be one of the the hard nosed football teams that you played, but. We're going to challenge you a little bit differently offensively, but you know, Rich is a great coach. I mean, the things that that he's been able to do, and uh, you know, I know it didn't work out. Jeff Castile didn't go with him to to Michigan, and uh, you know, he left there, and then they got back together out in Arizona, and then uh, you know, things weren't going great there, and then that's what happens at the big schools. They mm-hmm. tell you you better make some changes, or we will make a change with you. So Jeff was at Nevada for a couple of years. It's great to have him back, and we have a chance to still talk and tell lies and all those kind of things. But uh, but Rich, he's he's heck of a heck of a coach, and they were talking about bringing him back to WVU. He didn't leave there in great shape, but no. Uh, no. but they uh, but you know they were winning, and uh, that's how he got the job yeah. in Michigan. But it's it's different. It's a it's a crazy business at that level, and I can't tell you that you know a, a lot of detail not having been there. But mm-hmm. it's it's a whole different world. Is it pretty cool to think though that that connection started in the WVIAC because Jeff Castile going to WVU with Rich Rodriguez had to be because of how well. And Jeff Castile's defenses played against Rich Rodriguez's offenses because you guys had some wars during yeah, those years. There were some great matchups, and uh, there's no doubt about that. And and I think that was part of it too. I mean, great respect for each mm-hmm. other. I know those two guys did, and uh, and they they had some success up there. I mean, yeah. what Jeff was a Division One defensive coordinator of the year, I think twice, which is a, a huge honor. Sure. And. Uh, and he's proven that he certainly can be a, a good football coach and uh, at almost any level. Certainly, I'm sure thankful that he spent a lot of time with me. Tell us about the move to the Pennsylvania State Athletic Conference, Monty. It had been talked about for a while uh, while you were there uh, before it ultimately happened. Steve Murray as a commissioner. Still, uh, we were on a uh, we were on the Division Two football coaches uh, committee. And he started even back in the 90s trying to go say, you guys need to come up here. He goes, this is great. You're not going to have to travel as much. Uh, And and that part is true. But uh, I always looked at it. They wanted us more than we really wanted to do that, even though from top to bottom for a lot of those years, there was no doubt that, again, top to bottom, that was a tougher league than, Mm -hmm. than the West Virginia Conference. But it's different i think we've proven that we can uh compete very very well at that level and ernie's done a great job and uh you know it was a tough loss with with uh, iup and those have always been great games we've been on the better part of it most of the time but uh back then it was always in the playoffs if you got them right. and uh you know, then be able to go ahead and beat them in the playoffs and, and make that final four for a second year in a row um uh, Shepherd belongs. It's just it's it's different. I I wasn't comfortable with it when they were talking about it, 
especially once we've made the change from the West Virginia Conference to the Mountain East. But it, it's it's been a good move, and I'm sure they're probably saving a little bit of money, a little different than WVU getting into Big 12. I'm still struggling with that. Well, we got to send the fencing team down to Texas, you know, tomorrow. So <laughs> I, I that's got to be a huge amount of money, and uh, and things aren't going as well as as everybody hoped. But but that was a decision that they made as well, and you know, Shepard looks like it was a little better decision than maybe <laughs> the Big 12 for WVU. Johnny. I'd like to get back to talking about recruiting and scholarships and stuff, because as, as Matt had said, you guys weren't fully funded. Was there a lot of negotiation between the athletic department and the academic department as you're trying to bring kids in and, and find money as far as looking for academic money in different ways to, to bring people in and give them what you need to give them so they come? I, I think one of the things that probably most people don't realize is division two had two cuts in the number of scholarships that they could have we used to have 45 then they went ahead and cut it to 40 and then everybody lost 10 percent so you know you, you go from 95 to like 85 in division one and uh, 70 to 63 i guess i'm working my math here it's not so good <laughs> doing well yeah uh to 63 in, in one double a uh, or fcs and then we went another cut then from 40 to 36 and the tough thing I think about scholarship money in, in Division Two is even if you have all 36, I don't think we ever have. Uh, Gridiron Club has really helped us and, and do some things with that too. But you're dividing things up. How much? How much do I give this guy? Well, I'm going to get 10,000 from Glenville, so you're going to have to beat that. And it, that's the tough part is those little bitty pieces. And money, that's where the physics that Rob was talking about the beginning at the beginning come in. What do you think, and, and, and I know you were a little bit, bef you left a little before, but what do you think about the NIL? What do you think about all the money that, that's being able to be funneled to athletes from, from companies? It's so different because you don't see so much of that. You hear about it in Division One, all the different things that are there. And with that, Spencer Ratliff got a million bucks, uh, some kind of a deal, and then he didn't even play that year at Oklahoma. Uh, Joe, Fre Joe Freeland. Uh, was telling me he he was on the staff here for a year before I got here and Joe stayed for another four and we stayed very very close he's his family and ours but uh he was telling me once he started then to go ahead and coach again he was down at uh, Hampton Sydney after he left Hargrove Hargrave Military Academy and uh he said one of their guys got offered an NIL deal and I'm going really and uh, he goes yeah he goes Bo Jangles had to set up a deal with him $25 <laughs> a week and all you can eat at Bo Jangles and I'm going man division three division two that's, that's not a bad deal no that's uh, that's not bad at all <laughs> if you're in college and someone's giving you a free dinner that's right. that's worth something there man but it's it, it you know, doing a commercial for, you know, a car dealership or things. You you see a little bit of that. I, I, that one, and I don't open up a can of worms, but having been on the Division Two, well, this was the NCAA Football Rules Committee, so that was all, everybody. It was Division One down to Division Two II or Three, and, uh, and also those high schools that – use college rules like Texas and I think Massachusetts is another state and so they met with us and we're doing all these things with the rules and you know they did the different things with you know you can fair catch even on the 10 yard line now and then you meet with the NFL because there's a lot of things that go on there that most people don't realize and we had that deal they took the one where you can't leave the line you can't leave the line till the ball's kicked so there's a lot of uh, of kind of different kind of play that uh, that goes into that too I got to stay on it even one year after I was done with the football rules committee. And the next year after I was done is when they started talking about the NIL and the transfer portal, which I just, I hate it. And it would have to be so much. And, you know, I was in talking with the guys the other day and, uh, you know, Josh Klein, we're talking about defense and he, uh, these are the guys that are going to get in the portal. You, you don't think about it at our level, not mm -hmm. nearly like you do. I'm going to build a team with the, the eight guys that I'm going to have coming in or this guy's, this is going to be the fourth school. How do you get trans? How do you transfer <laughs> those credits? How do you stay eligible? No one takes everything when you transfer. Um, and do you ever graduate? Uh, mm -hmm. But there's so many different things that are involved with that. But, you know, I'm just thinking, okay, the coach made me run after practice. I didn't want to, so I'm leaving. I, 
I, mm-hmm. I just it, it would be so difficult. I think for me now, I you get used to it. I haven't been exposed to it, but you know, I would have probably opened my mouth too much on that committee if sure. they had started talking about the transfer portal then. Yeah, the ease, the ease is which the kids can can move. But what you said is not when you transfer. And I've had a couple of my kids have transferred schools, and not every credit gets picked up. No. And there's a lot of wrangling that has to be done to fit stuff in. And I'm some of the some kids who would graduate probably don't because of the transfer portal, and that's that's sad because I mean it's such a such a very very minuscule amount of kids are going to the NFL. Well, and I just saw that the NCAA is going to make some changes to that that it's going to still be fine. It's not going to affect graduate students. And and I agree that that shouldn't be a deal. You've already taken care of that, and you're now looking for your last year uh, to get your master's degree someplace else. But they're going to get back to making it a little bit tougher unless there's unique situations, I guess, certain characteristics or – I don't know what types of things would, are going to be involved, but uh, you know it, it could be a, a number of different things. But it's going to change. It's not going to be as easy, and you're not going to be able to do it as often, uh, which I, I think they jumped into that too quickly. So you got whole, they're seeing it. You got whole teams saying, "All right, we're all uh, we're all in the transfer portal." Where a coach leaves, you going, "Well, right. you know, that's going to be this guy's coming in. He's going to run the option, or they're going to blitz all the time, and uh, you know, so." That has something to do with it, but I mean, that's it, it is it's crazy and uh, it can have a huge impact on you. I noticed you came back to the option again. That's, you know, <laughs> I haven't seen that in football in a, in a few years. But. Well, and when you do, you know, it's oh. kind of well, unless you watch the service academy, it's all cyclical, know. right? It's that's going right. to come back at some point. Someone's going to go, You remember that old offense? Nobody's really running that, and no, no the, defense knows how to handle it now. The wishbone, so. the veer, but but you watch <laughs> the you know. wing T. Well, yeah. did you see Jacksonville run that three back set to uh, put the game away yeah. in their playoff game the yeah. other night? Right. Nope. I mean, right. That's, that was a throwback. Yep. Right. But the service academies, they still right. do that, yeah. and it's it's kind of crazy. When I, I always talk about, uh, you know, my days at at Millican and who else is coaching and uh, and Coach Monken at, at the at uh, the Naval. Or, I, well, that'd be bad if I said that. He's at West Point, <laughs> and he's a Millican guy, and uh, you know he's uh, Jeff Monk, and he he's, does a great job. His whole family is in coaching. One's. <laughs> I don't know whether one of them is Georgia or whatever, but one of them is the offensive coordinator and the play caller or whatever. So that that family is uh, is tremendous. But but yeah, you don't see you just don't see that option much anymore. Take us into this process of of being uh, selected for the college football Hall of Fame. How how did that come about? How did you find out? And what comes next? Matt, I, I got nominated, I guess, last year, and of course they. This is a, a almost a year long process. Uh, because they just finished the last class uh, in Las Vegas, uh, you know, in December. So those guys all went in, and then after that, then they go ahead and let the next class know. My wife had said, you know, did you ever hear anything about that? And I said, well, I don't know. They just finished the last class, so maybe we will or whatever. But it was funny the next day, uh, which was the the day of the national championship game, when they did announce those things, and uh, she you get a box at uh, sitting out in front of the car or out in front of the house, and uh, so opened that up. The football that they gave Tim Tebow uh, when they were doing the the pregame things, yeah. uh, that was in there and a congratulatory you know letter saying that you've been you know you've been selected. Uh, mm-hmm. So I mean it was really neat. It also said keep your mouth shut till after two thirty. You know because <laughs> <laughs> you, you can tell your wife, tell the people in the house, but don't say anything to anybody else. And and they did. They they announced it. Uh, you know I think it was a two thirty to four thirty program, but. Um, so now one of the things that will happen is they'll have that uh, induction ceremony. That will be a big uh, dinner, and I, I'm struggling with me and a tux. But that will be in December, like the 4th, 5th, right. and 6th. Now they will come to a home football game uh, and, and have some type of presentation at that mm-hmm. point in time. They do it for all the players and, and coaches that are going in, which is pretty neat. But uh, there's there's other things that are involved. But in terms of the exact travel plans and, and how many people might be, right. uh, you know, you might be able to go ahead and, and reserve tickets for or anything like that. I don't know. That's an expensive place out there. So, <laughs> and I'm not gambling, so I'm not going to make it worse. Are you putting the speech together already, or yeah. are you a procrastinator? Will you wait till the end? Man, yeah. I I don't know how they would have time for 18 players and okay. four coaches to all speak. So I don't I don't know about that. All part. right, I, it would have to be brief if anybody did it, but I I don't think. So I, I've had a chance to look at some of those with the National Football Foundation. 
mm-hmm. you see that and they always say okay now you can watch it online or something like okay. that but uh but i i i'm not sure that that's going to be a part of it there's just too many people i yeah. i think so but they said hey we'll be contacting you periodically <laughs> okay i got some time 11 <laughs> months so <laughs> <laughs> when when you hire Bodwell as your speechwriter, if you, it turns out you need a speech, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Just your thoughts when when you read and see the other names of of inductees, and and you see your name in the midst of those names. What what's that do to you? It, it it's so it's really humbling because mm-hmm. then you always think, man, that, those those guys, you know, mm-hmm. you they're great, you know. Reggie's doing the Wendy's commercials, which I'm hoping I'm going to spend some time with him, <laughs> or, or get a Wendy's commercial. But yeah, Wendy's. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, but I, I think it it is it is humbling, and then you start thinking about you know there there were how much was involved. This was a long period of time, and uh, you know you look at those those great people and uh, John Lockhart who went in the year I think a year ago was at California and was at W and J and was very very successful. He actually called me the other day. He says you're you're going to love it out there. He says. <laughs> expensive dinners but he said that uh, you'll really like it and it's a, it's a first class situation but uh, and and that was great we played against him at, at, when he was at Cal and uh, but it again you, you you look at the enormity is that a word that mm-hmm. i should use of the people that are in and there's what a thousand some people that have have and the five points six million who've played or coached in in college football so it it is humbling and sometimes you, you think i'm you know i'm not really getting the full effect of this yet it hasn't really set in but uh it is it's just a, a so appreciative of, of such an honor it, it's hard to even explain yeah well marty kidder congratulations to you job thank, well yes. done thank you very well much deserved. i really appreciate it it's great spending the hour with you right. thank you the coach hall of fame coach now you can call him marty kidder mm-hmm.